and uh, good evening everyone good afternoon good morning and all of us who are joining from different time zones so thank you for joining us for a dialogue with asian pathfinders i am palavi adi i'm the co-founder of asian pathfinders along with shreyas deshmo uh, who's here in the video you can see him uh, and today's dialogue is the culmination of our month long series on global terrorism and violent extremism issues that we've had over the month of july and we thought a good way for rounding it would be having a panel discussion on uh, getting regional perspectives on the issue of terrorism so we have someone speaking from south asia southeast asia as well as central asia and we have colonel uh, sushil pradhan who will be moderating the session so before i give it to him a brief about asian part finders so we started in 2020 as a knowledge sharing platform where we aim to bring scholars practitioners academics together for constructive dialogues and discussions like we have today Uh, and uh, we do it through our fireside chats, which are on Saturdays, and dialogues, which is the last Thursday of the month. Uh, our dialogues are a way for getting experts from different walks of life, on, and deep diving into a very specific topic from different perspectives. That's what we're able to do today. And uh, our upcoming sessions in the month of August. The month is focused on uh, non-traditional security threats. Uh, and we're going beyond climate change but we're looking at i know that's the one that strikes us first um, and i also have that image but we're looking at the first session on how the access to water and food uh, can help secure social political stability or create instability that will be on 7th of august and these session details are always on our linkedin facebook instagram and twitter pages so you can always go follow us there and have a look at uh, when these sessions are there our sessions are open so you can always just register and join Uh, guidelines uh, please stay on mute because we do record these sessions and put it on youtube later so for the benefit of the wider community uh, so this recording gets hampered because of too much noise in the background uh, again one thing we always say is respect the views of others we all come from different walks of life we have our very strong beliefs at times on specific topics uh, but let's express ourselves through the chat section with your questions and comments Like I said, you can find us on social media. Uh, so today's session, I know Kanu Pradhan will introduce the panelists, but I have the pleasure of introducing him. Uh, he is currently the CEO at Midcat Advisory Services, a premium risk management consultancy. Uh, with and <coughs> sorry, he has led led several risk management assignments in Iraq, Myanmar, Bangladesh, and difficult geographies in India. He has an MPhil in National Security Studies and an MBA from Pune. university and he has about 22 years of distinguished career in the indian army where he has handled combat instruction of staff and multi national assignments he was decorated for gallantry in counter terrorist operation and has served extensively in the himalayan high altitude as well as in the desert uh, he was also responsible for preparation of policy documents doctrines geopolitical assessments and geo strategic approach papers uh, he has been a combat trainer in tactics anti tank missiles fighting vehicles and he was also part of the un peacekeeping mission in sierra leone and a trainer with international un peacekeepers at the united nations training center in germany and in india so he has been instrumental in building the information and intelligence services business at medcat uh, which i have had the pleasure to be part of some years ago and he is a great mentor by the way uh, and he has uh, also been uh, uh, working uh, speaking on uh, multiple forums both nationally as well as internationally on these issues So over to you, Kanal Pradhan. Thank you very much, Pallavi. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be on this platform, and I, I really admire you and Shreyas for the wonderful work that you are doing for the kind of speakers you bring to uh, the table. Such elite speakers, such knowledgeable speakers, and uh, such great audiences as well. Because I attend most of your events very religiously. and uh, today it's it's a singular honor to be here to moderate a panel discussion between such a eminent lineup of speakers who uh, i have been following some of them like i have been reading dr rohan's writings and i just mentioned some time back i have met dr smriti i have been reading her writings i have read her books so it's it's really a wonderful feeling to be here on this platform introducing them and moderating a discussion so i am not going to take too much time on the opening remarks which you have allotted me some time for but i feel that i'll be wasting the audience's time by speaking about 
something which I don't know much about and which the speakers know a lot about. Uh, you know, when I was in, in uniform, I always looked at terrorism from the other perspective that all we knew is that this is a person who has to be taken down because they are conducting anti-national activities. Of course, thereafter, I did go into research, studying about them. And uh, today we are uh, on a very singular kind of topic where we are looking at terrorism from the regional perspective. And because we have experts who are all based out of our work in Asia, I thought, let me just keep my opening remarks limited to what's happening in Asia from the perspective of terrorism. And uh, so, you know, earlier, the defining feature of terrorism traditionally in most of Asia was always identity based and fighting for territory, traditional cultivation areas, traditional cultures, ethnicity, etc. And it was very um, understood that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. So it depends on which angle or which perspective you are looking at a group from a terrorist organization from. And there were lots of artificial boundaries which contributed to this, whether it was colonialism, whether it was imperialism, whether it was the Soviet Union. But despite all this, the ties between human beings remain. The cross-border cultural, ethnic, linguistic, familial linkages remain. So terrorists, terrorism, terrorists or freedom fighters, whatever you would like to call them to start with, always got safe heavens, they got support, they got financing, they got sympathy. And of course, my friend's enemy is my friend. So there was a lot of cross-border inimical support. There was cross-border support to terrorist organizations. Over the times, what has happened is that religious fundamentalism has increased by leaps and bounds and has led to transnationalization of terrorism. And now, that actually has become its visible face, especially in Asia. There have been 19 international conventions on terrorism, but there has been no single agreed upon definition of terrorism. So I'm not even going to go there. And strangely, this is again played out so much in Asia. What happens when the terrorist organization becomes the government? So for example, we are seeing something like that happening in Afghanistan with the Taliban. We saw it happening in Algeria. We saw it happening in South Africa, where uh, Nelson Mandela was declared a terrorist for many years. Uh, we saw this in Malaya. We saw this in Nepal, where the Maoists were, who are now part of the government, were once uh, regarded as terrorists by the ruling uh, gov government. We saw this within India, where uh, Mizoram-based insurgents were fighting for what they call their freedom and was a terrorist organization and became part of the government, amalgamated into the legitimately constituted and elected government. So, uh, you know, terrorism in Asia has has its has various faces, various facets, and today the pandemic has really given time and space for some of these entities to reorient themselves, regroup, realign, collaborate, exploit new vulnerabilities, and also formulate new narratives to further their specific causes. If we look at South Asia, uh, I think there are people who have been observing this very carefully and you have global terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIS also on the lookout to find new terrorist territories and to remain relevant. They have also been known to exploit the vast militant landscape that is already existing in the region. If you look at the Sri Lanka Easter bombings and the Holy Artisan Bakery attack in Bangladesh, these are not one-off incidents and indicate a much larger issue at hand. And now uh, with the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, once again, the spotlight is on the Afghanistan-Pakistan region and uh, it's always known tag of the terrorism hotspot of the world. If you look at Central Asia, the region has always been known for its foreign fighters and the issue of returning foreign fighters in safe havens in these countries. Although the region by itself has not witnessed many terrorist accidents, incidents. In Southeast Asia, the region has some of the world's oldest and most active militant Islamist organizations, dating back to post-colonial insurgency. Since then, radicalization and terrorism landscapes have evolved dynamically in Southeast Asia, in which now these militant Islamist groups flourish. So whether it's Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, and other geographies, uh, terrorism is active and uh, alive in Southeast Asia as well. So we have today with us 
experts in South Asia, experts on Central Asia, and experts in Southeast Asia from studying, understanding, and trying to decipher the terrorist perspective. So without any delay, I'm going to move on to the speakers and introduce one by one the speaker, request them to give their opening remarks, and then move on to the next speaker. So once we've had the opening remarks from all the speakers, I'd like to ask you all to drop in your questions into the chat box, and then we shall take on the audience questions. And if you would like to address a question to a specific speaker, request you to put that name so that it becomes easier rather than having an open-ended uh, question to any of the speakers. So let me start by introducing Dr. Smriti Patnaik. Uh, Dr. Smriti Patnaik is a research fellow at IDSA. Her area of specialization is South Asia, obviously, and her current research project is titled as India's response to China's presence in South Asia, challenges and policy options. She has been a recipient of many international fellowships. She was a visiting Asia fellow uh, at the Department of International Relations, Dhaka University in 2004, and a follow-up grantee in 2007, researching on politics of identity in Bangladesh. She was the recipient of the Kodikara Award in 1999 in Colombo, a postdoctoral fellow at an uh, institution in Paris, and she was also attached to the Center for International Relations and Research in Paris. She's been elect selected to attend the symposium on the East Asian Security Program conducted by the US State Department in 2011. She was a visiting fellow at the International Peace Research Institute in Oslo. She's been a visiting professor on ICCR's India Chair at the University of Colombo for a semester. She has lectured extensively on India's foreign policy in South Asia at Colombo University, Sir John Kotewala Defense University, Asia Center in the University of Melbourne, University of Karachi, University of Peshawar, University of Dhaka. She was the course director of the India-Bangladesh Studies Program conducted jointly by Jamia Milia Islamia and Dhaka University. She specifically developed a unique course on political developments in Bangladesh 1971 to 2010 as part of the European Union funded uh, project on curriculum development on peace building in Europe and South Asia, which was organized by the Nelson Mandela Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution, Jamia Milia Islamia in 2011. She's published a number of books, 60 research articles in various peer, -year, peer reviewed journals, both in India and in abroad. She has contributed more than 50 chapters in edited books and delivered lectures on security issues both in India and abroad. So uh, I think uh, she, she is eminently suited to talk about the issue of regional terrorism and specifically in the context of South Asia. So over to you, Dr. Spruti, for your opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pradhan, for that very elaborate uh, introduction. And I think, uh, you know, thank you, you know, Asian Pathfinder Shreyas and Pallavi for this invitation. And uh, in fact, when I looked at the topic, conceptualizing <laughs> terrorism, and the first thing which came to my mind, probably, you know, it is one of the most complex issue of how to conceptualize terrorism. Like uh, Mr. Pradhan also spoke about that one man's, uh, you know, terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. And especially as you put it in the context of South Asia, uh, where we have open and porous border, uh, it, it becomes, you know, the phenomena of terrorism does not remain confined to the territorial boundary of the nation state. So therefore, you know, this, this becomes a, a kind of uh, main challenge. So therefore, not only, uh, you know, how to conceptualize uh, the terrorism problem in the region is not just a problem, but also the challenge of how to deal with it. Like, uh, for example, you know, the question is that who is a terrorist? There are uh, people who will say that, well, you know, some of the time it is state sponsored, some of the time it is state supported, uh, or at least uh, uh, some of the time uh, it is basically uh, you know, providing them a kind of uh, patronage uh, in terms of even, you know, providing them with shelter. And there are also times where the state, even if they would have wanted, 
you know, they have not been able to take action against certain groups who are operating cross border because, you know, they don't have the capability to take that kind of action. I'll give an example. Uh, for example, when, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, ter the groups were flushed out from uh, Myanmar in the Northeast. They, they took shelter in uh, Bhutan. And Bhutan took some time to flush out the groups which were hiding, especially the incident groups in the Northeast, were hiding in the southern part of Bhutan. So because, you know, the state did not have that kind of capacity or thought perhaps immediately it will not be able to take any action against, you know, the Ulfa, which was sheltering there. So in a sense, uh, if you look at uh, the boundaries and the, you know, the manner in which South, South Asia is situated, so flushing out from one state necessarily doesn't mean that you can really deal with the issue of the terrorism or the cross-border support because they take help of the, as, uh, you know, Mr. Pradhan was mentioning, uh, they take help of the cross-border, familial and ethno-cultural linguistic ties where you know they get they get sheltered because of this kind of you know linkages similarly if you look at in the context of uh, ltt at one point of time uh, india provided them with uh, some sort of training but of course they also got their training in israel uh, to become and also with the, in the palestinian camp because the terrorist group also keep on exploring you know, where they will get the maximum uh, kind of, you know, where they can do the capacity building, if one can use the term capacity building in terms of the training. So therefore, you know, if the Sri Lankan government takes action against the LTT, obviously they found shelter in Tamil Nadu with whom they not only shared the linguistic and cultural linkages, but also, you know, the intermarriages, the familial ties uh, are very much there. So. Uh, and if, like, for example, you know, Mr. Pradhan was also speaking about the Maoist uh, group in Nepal, where India termed them as terrorists, including the United States. You know, the government was negotiating with them. And in fact, India at one point of time in 2006 uh, started midwifing uh, and bringing in the seven political parties together in Nepal to, you know, to come out with a peace process, which actually led to the rehabilitation of the Maoist group in Nepal. So in a sense, you may uh, con uh, conceive a particular group as a terrorist, but also at the same time, you are not completely ruling out, you know, engaging them. Then I can give another example in the, in the context of the LTT, uh, when India banned LTT as a terrorist group after the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi, one saw the Sri Lankan state negotiating with the LTT for quite some time, you know, till 2005, five, six, when finally, you know, the fourth Ilam war uh, broke out. So, so in that sense, when somebody is, you know, that, that is where, you know, I said that it's a problematic uh, to how do you conceptualize terrorism in the regional context? Because each of the state have their own, own views on this. And similarly, if you look at, uh, you know, Though, of course, you know, the question is that the state remains a legitimate actor. So therefore, from that particular perspective, we try to define a person who is a terrorist is mostly non-state actors. You know, they're not state actors. They, they cannot use violence, you know, against, against the people. But I also was looking at, you know, this... Uh, uh, the terrorism, South Asia terrorism portal. And this is, you know, very stark that from 2000 to 2001, July, you had the incident of killing of 51,073. So, which actually has, uh, you know, if you look at the complete figure, it is 1,68,410, taking both civilian, the terrorists, and also the security forces who have been killed in the last nearly 20 years, you know, this, this, because they collect generally data from the local sources. Now, when you speak of the, you know, the kind of terrorism, we are also speaking of the cross-border linkages. Here I'm, you know, not just in the question of Pakistan, you know, where uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, the cross-border um, context of how terrorist, terrorism is also used as state instrument. Sometime or other, some states have used uh, terrorism as a state instrument. So there actually the problem of conceptualization becomes a problem. Are they terrorist or are they freedom fighter? Depending on which side of the boundary you are. Uh, you also have the same context, you know, with the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, you see 
some of the groups who are fighting uh, in Afghanistan along with Taliban are also the groups who are operating across the border in, in, in Pakistan. And they have ethnic linkages, like for example, the Pashtun groups uh, from the Fatah area who are, you know, who have taken shelter uh, in Afghanistan, especially in the southern part of Afghanistan. So, you know, they operate taking advantage of the ethno, you know, the ethno linguistic and the familial relationship which they have. Now, how do we deal with the terror? You know, this kind of terrorism. I think probably one of the thing is that the ambiguous concept of conceptualization of terrorism. I'll just very quickly come to the you know within the SARC how you know this has been conceived. Uh, I think I have always argued that if we're going to deal with that kind of network, which the terrorists have in terms of the ethnocultural linkages, taking help of the porous and the open border, which also India shares. Similar also between Pakistan and Afghanistan, there is a long porous border. So you have to replicate the non-state actors. Um, here I want to say that state actors have to replicate the non-state actors and establish similar kind of network to deal with them. Because if you don't have similar kind of network, they will take advantage of the porous border and can take shelter in places and without cooperation of the other country, of the neighboring country, I don't think you will reach to any kind of conclusion. Now, let me, you know, I found it very, very interesting that, of course, after 9-11, globally, uh, we have been speaking of, you know, about the issue of the terrorism and how most of the countries are being affected. I think probably uh, the 9-11 is portrayed as mother of all terrorism. But, you know, if you look at the reason, the South Asian reason, terrorism is not something which is very, very new. You know, it is not like, for example, in 1987, the SARC had the convention, SARC convention on terrorism. It had an additional protocol on terrorism following some of the, uh, you know, some of the um, UN resolution where to stop the terror finance and all. Uh, we had the protocol which was ratified in 2003. But the question is that if we have the convention on terrorism in 1987. Why is it that, you know, we have been facing this problem of cross-border terrorism, the financial support, and yet nothing was done about it. I think this is where the conceptualization is a problem. Now, like, for example, if you look at SAR Convention on Terrorism, which very clearly says states should refrain from organizing, instigating, assisting, or participating in acts of civil strife or terrorist acts in another state or accusing in organized activities within its territory directed towards the commission of such acts. So it's, it's, it's very, very clear. And yet you see that, you know, the state have been uh, supportive of a uh, terrorist act. Uh, there are also times where, you know, the incident groups have been uh, sheltering in the neighboring country, taking, you know, that is, there has no action been taken. So in spite of it being very clear what the state needs to do, it has not happened. Uh, similarly, if you look at the extradition, you know, extradition is there uh, in the in the in the SARC Convention of Terrorism. Of course, we had another extradition, which is part of the additional protocol of terrorism of of the SARC. But if you look at the extradition, it is equally ambiguous. Whereas, you know, it is very clearly says that state should not support terrorist activities, which is directed against another state, very clearly written. I found the extradition treaty extremely ambiguous. Like for example, it says for the purpose of extradition between SARC member states, any two or more contracting states may by agreement decide to include any other serious offense involved in violence, we shall not be regarded as political offense. Now you tell me, if you look at the kind of movement, uh, you know, ethno-national movement, which has also taken the form of terrorism. Now, how do you separate the, you know, the political objective of the terrorist group from terrorism? So therefore, when you say that it, you know, we shall not be regarded as a political offense or an offense collect, uh, connected or an offense inspired by political motives. Now you tell me which which particular issue actually is not connected to the political, uh, any uh, political objectives. Like for example, you know, there are groups who are fighting for the rights at one point of time, Bhutan also declared the people of the Southern, Bhut Southern Bhutan who were staying the Nepalese, of Nepalese origin as terrorists because they were demanding uh, political rights there. 
so therefore you know if you look at it it i feel that it is a non starter and therefore it is not uh, very surprising to know that uh, you know the extradition has not be, uh, has not worked the sark, sark extradition it is mostly happening in terms of the bilateral uh, extradition treaty which the countries have uh, have signed same is also case of cooperation on the issue of terrorism like for example between india and bangladesh india and nepal india and bhutan you have got many people extradited because of the extradition treaty and it is the countries these countries have also realized that they cannot shelter you know incident groups which actually is you know trying to establish connectivity network or trying to establish network with the other militant groups who are operating on the you know within the their own country and ultimately it will affect like for example i'll give an example of the bardhaman blast which took place in the border in in west bengal so if you look at that like for example bangladesh took action against terrorist group operating within its own country against its domestic terrorist group but many of the people crossed the border and took shelter across the border so therefore bangladesh effort to deal with the terrorism was not successful because they were incubating you know within indian border it is just because the bardhan blast took place then bangladesh and india realized the fact that even if one country takes an action against a terror terror group if the other country do, do not cooperate then it is likely that this will uh, in fact will become become a real real uh, trouble so like for i'll i'll just give an example of uh, you know this uh, uh, definition of terrorism which the member country you know started fussing among themselves in uh, when the sark protocol on terrorism was uh, uh rather, you know when it was discussed uh, it was when manmohan singh in his speech at dhaka summit emphasized that countries must stop harboring host hostile incident groups and criminal elements and put a stop to cross border terrorism and he also stressed on zero tolerance to terrorism the definitional complexity of this can be gauged from, gauged from the fact that pakistan in the kathmandu summit also made a distinction between acts of legitimate resistance and freedom struggle and acts of terrorism and uh, you know pakistan also said we are not in the business of building bridges if there is a gap in the definition of terrorism in a sense what you say terrorist if we say freedom fighter obviously there is a gap of definition so if there is no bridging of this gap so obviously you know we can't really fight the terrorism and all are welcome to keep their interpretation on the subject so that makes it very clear so you can have your own interpretation i can have my own interpretation and we can really definitely we cannot um you know fight against uh, you know this uh, terrorism because the conceptualization of a uh, terrorism has remained a problem and as i said i will reemphasize again replicate the terrorist network the state have to replicate the terrorist network if you have to fight you also need to have the same kind of regional solidarity which you see among the terrorist group operating across the south asia region uh, whereas the state look at terrorism as instrument of you know foreign policy the terrorist actually you know are not confined by the territoriality of the nation state they have very good network if they want to transport arm from one particular state to another state it reaches smoothly but if you want information to be given from another state you will not get any information so therefore not just the definitional aspect i think the non cooperation aspect of the states within the south asia actually has led you know the the you know the de defeat of the entire purpose of fighting terrorism you name it whatever freedom fighter insurgents terrorists or whatever group or ethno cultural nationalist movement you you turn it whatever i don't think the states are you know had that capacity to deal with the kind of porous border which facilitates the kind of terrorist activities which we have seen for past many many years 9/11 may be new to the united states but uh, the concept of terrorism and what is happening across the border is something which is not new and we probably are the first regional grouping who had the convention on uh, terrorism before any other reason i'll just end here thank you so much thank you ma'am very fascinating insights and 
very nice perspective that you have given that you know south asia being a victim was also the first to react was also the first to create an institutionalized way of thinking about terrorism but nobody took notice of it uh, and unfortunately least of all the members themselves took the least notice of it so uh, that's where things have not worked out and two very interesting takeaways which you mentioned i think i i have made a note of that and i uh, i will keep it from with me forever is if governments and authorities have to fight terrorists especially in south Af- south asian region uh, they must imbibe regional solidarity and cross border cooperation the way the terrorists themselves do and that's the way to do it thank you so much for those uh, remarks and we shall come back to you Uh, during the question and answer session and uh, i'll move on to uh, the next speaker that is dr parkhat tolipov so i would like to briefly introduce him uh, he is a doctor take doctorate from the tashkent state university he is also taught at the university of world economy and diplomacy in tashkent uh, where he got his phd in political science from 89 to 2002 he was a chief consultant for the presidential apparatus of of, of uzbekistan from 2005 to 2010 dr tolipov was teaching at the national university of uzbekistan uh, including courses like world politics and international security currently he is the director of the non governmental research institution called bilim karwani so please excuse me if i pronounce it incorrectly which is based in tashkent Dr Talipov is specialized in geopolitics regional security and regional integration in central asia nationalism and democratization in central asian countries at the same time he teaches at the webster university in tashkent in 2000 from 2003 to 2004 he was national professor at the osc center in tashkent he is also a fellow at the nato's defense college rome from 1997 to 2013 He was a fellow at Harvard University in 1999. He's been a visiting professor at the University of Georgia in 2004. He was also a visiting professor at the Middle East Technical University in Ankara in 2015 and a visiting researcher at the Atilim University in Ankara again in 2016. He's been a lecturer at the George Marshall European Center for Security Studies in 2004, 2005 and also the Geneva Center for Security Policy Two thousand eight, two thousand nine, two thousand ten, and two thousand eleven. He has also spoken at the OSC Academy in Bishkek. He extensively publishes his articles on Central Asian topics in various international journals. He is an author of the monograph uh, called "Grand Strategy of Uzbekistan in the Context of Geopolitical and Ideological Transformation of Central Asia," and not just this, more than two hundred other articles. He is a member of the International Editorial Board of the journal. Central Asia and Caucasus and he is also a member of the expert group of the journal Security Index of the PIR Center in Russia and the Central Eurasian Studies Society he is a fluent linguist and he speaks english russian french turkish and uzbek so so, so proud and happy to have such a accomplished panelist on today's discussion Uh, over to you dr farkad and for your opening remarks thank you very much sir for kind introduction uh, um, of my personality and uh, thank you very much uh, olavi and uh, all other colleagues for kindly inviting me uh, to this interesting conversation about terrorism Do you hear me well? I mean, uh, I'm in the hotel right now in the countryside. That's why I'm yes. concerned about the quality of uh, internet connection. We hear you well. We see Good. you very well, sir. Fine, fine. Uh, I'm in the countryside now, right now, not in the capital. So that's why I was I was a little bit concerned about uh, the quality of internet. Anyway, uh, thank you very much again. Um, uh, so uh, the topic which uh, we are discussing. today is really hottest maybe uh, in the international system the hottest topic because every uh, just a few countries probably exist in the world which probably didn't face uh, the threat of terrorism today terrorism exists everywhere in the latent form in the actual form visible invisible explicit or implicit so that's why 
it is really the hottest topic indeed. Um, I should say uh, that uh, my region, the region of Central Asia, uh, which consists of five uh, countries, I hope, uh, and I'm sure you know, names of all Central Asian uh, countries, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and my country, Uzbekistan, we call them five stands because of suffix stand. Uh, these five stands, uh, uh, you know, can be distinguished with some uh, peculiarities uh, in uh, different terms. I mean, uh, in terms of development, in terms of uh, geopolitics, in terms of um, democratization, in terms of security. Uh, in, uh, at, as, at, especially when we talk about threats uh, to national and uh, regional security uh, of Central Asian countries, so we first of all mention uh, terrorism, of course. Uh, for all uh, five Central Asian countries, when you ask specialists, experts, uh, ordinary people or politicians uh, about uh, how we classify uh, the uh, security threats, um, they probably will uh, uh, put on the first place the threat of terrorism as if this is the most dangerous uh, threat. Uh, maybe um, such a classification was uh, uh, caused by uh, impressions of um, terrorist actions, which almost all Central Asian countries faced uh, in different forms, in different scale, uh, after gaining independence. Uh, I think we lost you. Dr. Farkad, I think we have uh, lost you for a while. We'll just wait for a couple of minutes to... I think uh, his connection was not good, which he feared, and I think that's what. So, are you back? Yes, we can see you now, uh, and you'll just have to unmute yourself to join back. Dr. Farkad, can you hear me? Uh, Dr. Farkhat, can you try logging out and logging back in again once? Uh, sorry for that interruption, ladies and gentlemen. I think we'll just wait for him to join back. He did mention that he doesn't have a very good connection. Yes, he is back. Uh, so we can see you. Um, No, I think Dr. Farkad, we are not able to hear you. Uh, if you want, uh, maybe you can try switching off your oh, video. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You see, you hear You're me? Uh, yes, we can hear you, sir. Okay, 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 let's continue. So I think if you want uh, to preserve your bandwidth, you may like to switch off your video and uh, we'll hear you that way, you know? So you will not get maybe. disconnected. Yeah, yeah. And maybe other uh, colleagues also uh, will switch off their video regime and then the quality will be better. Uh, no, it okay. will be yours. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for this. Sorry for this. No problem. So let me continue. Um, uh, conceptualizing terrorism central Asian context is the topic which I would like to present shortly. Uh, previous uh, speaker also talked about the conceptual aspect uh, of um, uh, 
uh, definition of terrorism, how we define terrorism. And uh, of course, uh, there are many approaches uh, to uh, uh, this uh, term, uh, mostly depending on the historical, geographical, cultural context. Uh, and uh, also you talked about uh, identity issue, how you identify yourself, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, what is surprising today uh, is that uh, despite, um, you know, comprehensive uh, um, struggle against terrorism, uh, we don't have uh, internationally accepted clear-cut definition of uh, terrorism. We talk about fighting terrorism. We talk about global war on terror. We uh, portray some, inter some, some, some groups as terrorist organizations. There are numerous lists of uh, terrorist organizations, uh, et cetera. Uh, but uh, we don't have internationally accepted uh, concept of uh, terrorism. This is, uh, in my opinion, uh, a little bit strange uh, because uh, uh, when we talk about terrorism, when we talk uh, about fighting terrorism, it looks like, it sounds like we understand this phenomenon. We understand against whom we struggle. But when uh, you ask experts or politicians, uh, those military guys who, uh, you know, uh, fight them uh, face to face, what is terrorism? They uh, fail to give you <laughs> a clear cut definition. This is quite paradoxical. Uh, anyway, uh, I think we uh, have to um, speed up the process. I mean, by we, I mean international community. Um, leaders of international community maybe uh, speed up the process of uh, working out uh, the uh, definition. As you know, colleagues, there are many, uh, like uh, 12 or 13 international conventions uh, in the sphere of fighting terrorism. But uh, there is not a convention which would define uh, terrorism. And uh, as far as I know, uh, in particular, India was involved in the international process of drafting this uh, convention. And I hope this process will be uh, fast uh, and e efficient. And uh, soon, <laughs> finally, um, international community will adopt uh, such a convention. Uh, talk briefly, talking about the experience of my region, international, uh, Central Asia, uh, briefly, I, I, I have to mention several organizations which are quite uh, famous, well-known uh, internationally, who are uh, considered terrorist organizations in uh, Central Asian countries. They are, for example, Hezbollah Tahrir, uh, the extremist organization, uh, Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, uh, Akromia, this is the splinter of Hezbollah Tahrir, and uh, some others, smaller or bigger, uh, entities. Uh, first time when they appear uh, in the country, it was uh, just uh, the early early periods of independence uh, when the states and societies in Central Asia were quite fragile because they were engaged in uh, the process of uh, nationhood, statehood, and that's why it was relatively uh, easier for them, for terrorists, for extremists, to hire, to recruit, uh, to get some more supporters, and so on and so on. But interestingly, uh, in the context of Central Asia, uh, these organizations actually failed to um, expand uh, their activities. Uh, they were not uh, so big in number and in potential. Uh, and uh, the counter-terrorist actions uh, from the side of the government uh, by law enforcement agencies against them were quite successful. Most of them, most of them were cracked down. And uh, so some of them who survived such counter-terrorist operations just fled the country, uh, mostly towards uh, Afghanistan. And for example, IMU, Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, now, uh, uh, you know, they, they leave and they operate, they act uh, somewhere in Afghanistan, maybe in collaboration with Taliban, uh, and so, but we almost do not uh, hear about them, about the scale of their activity. Uh, I think they were, uh, to a great extent, demoralized 
after killing of two uh, relatively you know, charismatic leaders of uh, uh, IMU um, in Afghanistan. So after uh, these two leaders uh, were killed, uh, the new leaders uh, are not so much popular and not so much charismatic and not so much leader, let's say. Um, that's why IMU uh, doesn't pose serious threat to the uh, security of Uzbekistan or security of Central Asia. Yes, do, they do exist. They do operate somewhere uh, in the remoter area, uh, somewhere in Afghanistan. But nevertheless, uh, from the viewpoint of, uh, or, uh, especially from the point of view of uh, strategic uh, uh, consideration, strategic assessment, uh, IMU doesn't uh, represent a strong, strong entity posing a threat uh, to national security of Uzbekistan. Uh, by the way, I uh, touched uh, the issue of Taliban. Uh, we do not, we cannot uh, discuss the uh, threat of terrorism in Central Asia, threat of terrorism in Uzbekistan in particular, without taking uh, account of uh, the situation in Afghanistan. As you know, uh, today the situation exa is exacerbating in Afghanistan uh, in, in the course of uh, Taliban assault and Taliban. Uh, in quotation mark, successful movement uh, in different provinces in Afghanistan after the withdrawal of uh, American forces from Afghanistan. Uh, there are different reports coming from Afghanistan. We hear, we uh, read different articles, reports on TV, uh, in uh, internet sites, uh, and so on, about uh, this success of Taliban. Um, some people even make uh, murky predictions about um, future collapse of the government uh, of uh, the incumbent uh, government of Afghanistan and that Taliban will come to power, they will overthrow the government and so on and so on. Actually, myself personally, I do not believe uh, to such a scenario. Um, but uh, anyway, when uh, we discuss this phenomenon of Taliban, I think uh, we, uh, this is also, by the way, a very interesting lesson for all, for all of us, for all per, primarily experts who are studying this phenomenon uh, of terrorism. Uh, this is a very interesting lesson uh, because uh, we, when we study uh, the situation in Afghanistan, when we study the phenomenon of Taliban, uh, in my opinion, we face, uh, you know, more often than not, a lot of controversies, a lot of controversies. And the more I study, terrorism uh, in this area, the more I come to conclusion, uh, to assumption, let us say, about uh, the origin of terrorism elsewhere in the world, not only in Afghanistan context. For instance, when we talk about Afghanistan, sorry, about terrorism, we always use such uh, expressions as non-state actors, right? Uh, or uh, terrorism as a non-conventional threat, things like that. But in my opinion, uh, maybe uh, my arguments uh, may sound a bit uh, controversial, but anyway, uh, I can be wrong, but uh, I think uh, the concept of non-state actors should be taken with great uh, reservation and uh, cautiously, because uh, uh, as I believe, um, there is no non-state actor. In one way or another, in one degree or another, all those guys, all those groups who are portrayed as non-state actors are state actors, actually. Because, and when we say, uh, when we talk about some, some guys, some people as putting non-conventional threats, actually appear to be conventional, uh, that they put conventional threats. Why? Why? Look. Uh, take Taliban or other uh, terrorist organizations uh, operating uh, elsewhere in the world. Okay, I take the case of Central Asia and Afghanistan. Uh, how many people are uh, in uh, this uh, group, in this organization, a terrorist organization, uh, Taliban? 20,000, 30,000, or how many? Um, I think it's not a big as compared to armies of uh, the state. For instance, in Af Afghan army, uh, there are about 
300 people, 10 times more than 1,000, okay? So in terms of uh, number, in terms of the size, incomparably small uh, Taliban is. Uh, okay, another factor, supply. Neither Taliban nor other terrorist organizations in the world have their own plans producing weapons, tanks, bombs, whatever, mines. They don't have aircrafts of their own. Everything is supplied. Who produce weapons? Who produce different other sources of supply? Uh, be them uh, foods, living places where terrorists live, equipment, ammunition, only states. Okay? Uh, and um, from this perspective, well, Taliban or other terrorist organizations, albeit seemingly non-state actors, get a state support because they don't have, I repeat, their own, their own uh, plans or companies, let's say, who would uh, produce their own weapons or uh, cultivate their own foods, uh, have uh, provide living space, equipment, ammunition, and so on and so on. From this perspective, uh, I think we should revise the concept of uh, terrorism as a non-conventional threat, terrorism as non-state act, etc. Well, uh, imagine also another controversy uh, when it comes to uh, the, uh, our, uh, you know, investigation of the phenomenon of Taliban. Uh, countries in the world have different perspective, different uh, attitude towards this group of people. Uh, on the level of United Nations, uh, Taliban is uh, a terrorist organization. So for UN, it's a terrorist organization. Until recently, the United States also, you know, had uh, this name in its own list of terrorist organizations. But recently, uh, the character of this uh, group was changed from terrorist organization to insurgency. This was quite surprising for me. Until recently, Uzbekistan uh, thought and officially uh, was in the, on the position that Taliban is a terrorist organization. But recently, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Uzbekistan stated officially that Taliban is no longer a terrorist organization. Uh, according to Russian perspective, Russia uh, considers Taliban a terrorist organization, prohibited in Russia. But surprisingly, uh, Russian officials, Minister of Foreign Affairs, get in touch with them and uh, you know uh, have contacts and direct negotiations with Taliban. The neighboring country, Tajikistan, never recognized uh, Taliban, never talked to them, never met them. And for Tajikistan, Taliban is a terrorist organization. And as far as I know, India also uh, think India's position is that Taliban is a terrorist organization. So you see so many, so many um, states, regional states, neighbors of Afghanistan or global powers have different perspective on uh, Taliban. Uh, so until and unless the international community have ha, comes to one single common, um, you know, uh, designation of this group, the fight against terrorism will never end. Okay, or will be always like a half measure. I think. Uh, so we have to clarify this issue. We have to come to one single uh, and common perception. What is also controversial is that the international, the global international organization, the Dr. United Farkas, Nations. Uh, sorry to I'm coming you. to an end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. finishing. I'm finishing. Okay. Just okay. three seconds. Great. Just thirty because seconds. We have lots of questions also coming. Yeah, up. yeah. International organization, global universal organization, United Nations, uh, portrays Taliban a terrorist organization. Is it sufficient for all others? <laughs> Because all others, all countries of the world are members of the United Nations and they have to obey with uh, UN resolutions and so on, UN approaches. Is it sufficient for all of them, or all countries of the world to you know, attach to this uh, position? 
if UN believes that Taliban is a terrorist organization, why should other countries have other positions? This is the open question for all of us to discuss further. So uh, uh, with this example of controversies and our attitudes to terrorism, I, would, I wanted just to demonstrate how conceptually, conceptually we always face uh, either geopolitics or interests of uh, certain countries or something else. Uh, and uh, that's why without solving this dilemma, these controversies, it will be very difficult to fight terrorism. Thank you. Thank you for your views, uh, Dr. Farkad, and really interesting take on the issue of non-state actors and uh, what is a correct definition of uh, the terrorism. And uh, thank you. There are questions for you, but we'll come back to that. But before that, I want to move to somebody who's going to speak to us about uh, another aspect and another dimension of terrorism in the Southeast Asian region. And for that, we have with us Dr. Uh, Professor Rohan Gunaratna, well-known writer and thinker. He's an honorary professor at the Kotawala Defense University, Sri Lanka, and he's also the senior advisor to its Department of Defense and Strategic Studies. He's also a professor of security studies at the Nanyang Technology University in Singapore. Uh, he got his master's in the University of Notre Dame in US and his doctorate from the University of St. Andrews in UK, where he was the British Chevening Scholar. He's also been a former scholar at uh, the Combating Terrorism Center at the US Military Academy at West Point and at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He has been invited to testify on the structure of Al-Qaeda before the 9-11 Commission. Uh, an editor and author of 30 books, over 30 books actually, including Inside Al-Qaeda, Global Network of Terror. He's also edited the Insurgency and Terrorism series of the Imperial College Press in London. He's a trainer for national security agencies, law enforcement authorities, and military counterterrorism units. He's interviewed terrorists and insurgents in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, Saudi Arabia, and other conflict zones, which is really a commendable achievement. And for advancing international intelligence cooperation, he received the Major General Ralph Von Van Dimon Award as well. So we are really happy to have you here with us, uh, Dr. Rohan, and over to you. Can you hear us? I think he has to unmute. Uh, Professor Rohan, uh, uh, you may have to unmute uh, because we can't hear you. Let me let me thank the organizers yeah. for organizing this conference during this period. It is because in Afghanistan, the Taliban is inching towards Kabul. And whether we like it or not, both the Taliban and its rival Islamic State of Khorasan will dominate significant portions of Afghanistan in the coming weeks and the coming months. The Western drawdown and the Western withdrawal clearly demonstrates that they could not win the war in Afghanistan. It also clearly demonstrates a tilt in power of the Western forces and the rise of Asia. I would like to say that Conflict zones such as Afghanistan are the main crucibles where there are extremist ideologies, there is significant suffering, internal displacement, refugee flows, and production of terrorists. So, unless the regional and the international community work together, we will all suffer from extremism and terrorism. So there's a huge failure on the part of the international community to stabilize Afghanistan after 20 years of having a presence. And it clearly demonstrates that our security intelligence and our military forces are no longer capable of projecting power 
and staying in conflict zones to stabilize those areas. Afghanistan presented a very significant challenge after the US and the Western nations and the Middle East supported the anti-Soviet multinational Afghan Mujahideen campaign. We saw that more than 30 terrorists and extremist groups from the Middle East, from Africa, from Asia, from the Caucasus were trained in Afghanistan. And after Taliban emerged as a powerful entity in Afghanistan, Taliban gave refuge to Al-Qaeda and 30 different terrorist groups. Today, the face of the Taliban has not changed. As a man who has interviewed a number of Taliban leaders, including Mullah Mutawakil in Kabul, including many of their detainees in Bagram, I can share with you that the face of Taliban has not changed. They will continue to train other foreign terrorist groups when they come to power. If you look at the UN report, you will see that already so many threat groups, including Al-Qaeda, are operating in Afghanistan. In many ways, as Afghanistan shaped the global security landscape immediately before and after 9-11, Afghanistan 2.0 will shape the next wave of terrorism. There will be Indians, Sri Lankans, Maldivians, Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, Central Asians, and Southeast Asians that will travel to Afghanistan very soon. And they will train and they will fight against the Afghan military. I believe the time is right for governments to organize at a global, regional, sub-regional level to assess the trajectories of Taliban the trajectories of Al-Qaeda, the trajectories of the Islamic State, so that we will be able to prevent the descent to chaos of Afghanistan. Let me share with you, as much as in South Asia, the groups in Southeast Asia were very much empowered by that initial training that was provided in Afghanistan. For example, the group known as Jama Islamia that did the Bali bombing, where 202 people were killed, it was trained in Af Afghanistan. Today, Jama Islamia has evolved to the Islamic State in Indonesia. Of course, there's a smaller group of Jama Islamia that still operates as Jama Islami and their allegiance is to HTS, Hayat Tahrir al Sham or Al Qaeda. So, what you can say and what you can see very clearly is that the mother of all conflict zones was Afghanistan. Why do I say that? It is because the founding father of the Islamic State, Abu Musab al zakawi was in Herat on the border of Iran when the 9-11 attack took place and immediately after the US forces intervened in Afghanistan, he traveled through Mashhad and Tehran and traveled to, to the north of Iraq in Kurmal where he organized Al-Qaeda in Iraq that later evolved into the Islamic State of Iraq, Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. And 2014, July, the group evolved into the Islamic State. 
So Afghanistan is the mother of all battle zones. And I believe the security landscape of Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Central Asia, as well as Southeast Asia, will change significantly. One must never believe Taliban. This is the most important lesson we have learned by fighting terrorism. Threat groups will say what they want for their tactical advantage. Only if we are foolish, we will believe what they say. It is more important to look at what they are doing rather than what they are seeing. If you look at the most recent events of Taliban, they have killed surrendered personnel, they have killed civilians, and their brutality has not changed. I also want to share with you that they are enforcing the same rules and regulations on Muslim women. Although there is some change, a very minor change about going to school, but largely their ideology remains unchanged. With regard to Southeast Asia, the biggest threat stems not from the Al-Qaeda aligned Taliban, but from the Islamic State Khorasan aligned Islamic State. In fact, if you look at Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, there are more than 36 Islamic State aligned groups operating. It's the largest Muslim country in the world. Indonesia's Detachment 88 has managed the terrorist threat, but not the ideological threat. The ideological threat is coming largely from Salafi Wahhabism. That is uh, ideology directly opposed to traditional and local Islam, what you call Sufism. So I would say that the best antidote to protect our civilian population, especially our Muslim brothers and sisters, is to promote Sufism, to promote local and traditional Islam, and to very closely watch any Salafi Wahhabis, any Salafi Wahhabi funding, because that is where terrorism will emerge. I can share with you, having interviewed the Islamic State detainees after the Easter Sunday attack in Sri Lanka, that no one who is a local or traditional Muslim or a Sufi Muslim joined the Islamic State. Those who joined the Islamic State in Sri Lanka that mounted the Easter Sunday attack, they all came from either Jamaat Islami, Sri Lanka branch, or they came from the Tawheed uh, fraternity that is called the Salafi Wahhabi groups, National Tawheed Jamaat. So I believe that we have to move, we have to expand the way we fight, not only counter fire with fire where we catch or kill terrorists, but we also prevent extremism by having mixed schools where we don't have sectarian schools. We also prevent exclusivism. That is, we integrate all communities to live together in harmony. Zaharan, the Easter Sunday attacker came from a 100% Muslim village. Similarly, in Southeast Asia, it is no different. Wherever Muslims are well integrated to other communities, it is very difficult to plant that seed of exclusivism and extremism. So I believe that we should have both upstream counter-terrorism, which is countering exclusivism and extremism, and downstream countering terrorism. But the most effective strategy is not to fight terrorism. Terrorism is too late. We should fight ideological extremism. Let me conclude my remarks by asking my colleagues in India to take the leadership and create strategic platforms for sharing data with their regional countries, for exchange of personnel, for joint training, joint operations, and sharing of experience and expertise. 
let me share with you that although the India and Pakistan, there's discord, one day it is very likely the threat from Afghanistan will peak to such a point where India and Pakistan will cooperate and collaborate. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. So that's a really interesting note that you are leaving us on that the threat from terrorism in Afghanistan will grow to such an extent that uh, uh, countries which don't get along like India and Pakistan may someday collaborate together to fight terrorism. And I also like the parts about, uh, you know, uh, tackling terrorism both upstream and downstream. So thank you. Very interesting takeaways. Uh, there are lots of questions and uh, some of them have already been answered during the discussion. But uh, before we go to the question and answers, we have one new surprise entry uh, as a speaker. And I would definitely like to give him four, min four to five minutes of uh, our collective time. Uh, so we have uh, Mr. Bruce Panier with us. He's a longtime journalist and correspondent who covers Central Asia exclusively. He's been doing that for over 25 years. He currently writes uh, for Radio Free Europe and also for Radio Liberty's blog, uh, Kilok Ovozi, and appears regularly on the Majlis podcast for these. He's also worked in the past with Jane's EHS. So Bruce, uh, great having you here with us and uh, over to you for a quick uh, round of comments and then we move to the question and answer session. Well, thank you very much, and, and it's been a fascinating conversation to listen to. Uh, I'm I'm very thankful for the uh, grateful for the invitation just to listen in on this. Um, you know, my, I'll keep my comments short um, since, as you mentioned, I'm kind of a surprise uh, guest in this. Um, you know, and I look just to make clear that I look at all this through the prism of Central Asia, right? So that's what I've been covering for years and years, and and more than thirty years, I'm involved with the region. Um, right. You know, well, when we talk about fighting terrorism, um, you know, I look at the Central Asian region, and and uh, you know, who are terrorists and why do they become terrorists? Uh, you know, this is this is a very, uh, I mean, it's a hugely interesting question for me: is why would you want to do this? And in the case of Central Asia, it gets even more complicated because this is a country, or five countries anyway, um, you know, that have the Soviet heritage, so we know they had a secular background. Uh, they have a literacy rate in the upper 90 percent, you know, so these are not uneducated people. When the Taliban first appeared in Afghanistan, they used to refer to them as the as the donkey boys, right? They were they were illiterate uh, people from villages, uh, you know, so how does how do people in Central Asia, uh, you know, well-educated people, uh, you you know, coming off of 75 years, pretty much of, of uh, you know, secular government, how do they end up getting attracted to this? And, and um, the question, you know, the question, obviously, there's there's probably many answers for this, but it, uh, as I, I keep finding again and again, um, you know, it seems to be the social injustice that keeps coming back to this. And this is where you have to fight at this. Like I said, it's not, it's not a question of fooling you know, the uneducated into, into going into these groups or something, um, you know, but you have people that are willing, willing to go the, into these groups who are, are intelligent people, uh, and, and why would they go? And I keep coming back to the same thing of this, this question of what, what is social justice? Now, you know, the governments in Central Asia were essentially uh, the, the leaders of these countries were all the people that the, the Central Party of the Soviet Union had appointed to be leaders and when the Soviet Union collapsed, right? So they had really no background with Islam at all. If they did, they wouldn't have been picked to be in the positions that they had, and they wouldn't have been the presidents. So, you know, there was there was this credibility gap. On the one hand, they wanted to embrace Islam because it showed it was a distinction. Uh, you know, they, they weren't a colony of Russia anymore and they weren't part of the Soviet Union anymore. They, they were their own independent countries with majority Muslim population, although the leadership themselves did not know much about Islam. Uh, you know, and in the meantime, as the leadership tried to develop policies, they seemed to become more uh, focused on, on self-preservation. So, there was already an argument, you know, in the mid-1990s that uh, you, these governments were driving the secular opposition out of the picture entirely. Uh, and, and people warned them that if you did that, you were going to end up with underground groups uh, that would become extremists. And that would be the only kind of opposition that you could get in your country. So, uh, and, and that's pretty much what happened. Uh, Dr. Talibov had mentioned that, that there were, you know, the, uh, in Uzbekistan, there was a group that developed the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. They actually had the origins in the Tajik civil war. 
but um, you know, we, we see more and more of these groups have tried to get in and tried to get a foothold into Central Asia. And, and at times they've managed to get people to go over uh, you know, and, and join their groups. Um, you know, many, we've, we've been hearing about the groups in Afghanistan right now. Uh, Dr. Talib up again mentioned some of these, but I would mention also Jamiat Ansarulo is one, and that's that's actually ethnic Tajiks uh, who are out there, and there's hundreds of them that are there too. And these are, again, educated people from Tajikistan who have chosen to cross the border into Afghanistan. Some of them went to Syria, some of them went to Iraq. You know, what 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 made them do something like that? And And you keep coming back to the same conclusion that it was the hopelessness of changing their situation in the country. Now that these groups, these terrorist groups, extremist groups, hold out this idea of, of social justice. It's very vague, uh, but it seems to be enough, uh, attract enough hope on the part of a lot of these people that they're willing to go along with this. We've had entire families, entire villages in Central Asia pick up and move to Syria and Iraq to join the, you know, the Islamic State or some groups like that, based on this vague, vague promise that you know, we're a more fair society. Uh, we, we won't let the kind of corruption and nepotism that you're used to happen uh, you know, in our, our ideal society that we're trying to create. Uh, you know, and so this is always something that you gotta, you gotta think about when you're trying to fight against te uh, you know, Islamic terrorism, Islamic extremism. Uh, you know, and I know there's many reasons that people go to this, but go to these groups and are attracted to these groups. But at least in the case of Central Asia, like I said, what I keep coming back to time and again is the fact that there was something in the systems that they left, something that the, that the governments not only couldn't provide, but were unwilling to even try to provide. Uh, and so people realizing that they really had no other options uh, ended up gravitating toward these groups. And, and like I said, sometimes casting aside good jobs. Uh, good houses, all kinds of things, uh, you know, again, for base to follow this, this vague idea that somehow they were going to go to a more just society uh, that would be based on Sharia and, uh, and things would, you know, it would be some kind of Islamic utopia or something. And like I said, I'm a guest speaker and I don't want to spend a lot of time. I know you got a lot of questions, but I just wanted to throw that thought out there that if you're going to, if you're going to address this question, we know that you can't, you can't defeat this militarily. You know, it's an idea. These are ideas. Um, you know, so where, what are the roots of this? Where, where do you go to stop this at the, before it even gets foot and, and gets started? Yeah. Thank you, Bruce. And that's really interesting the way you brought it out, you know, that why? Why do these guys do it? And uh, one of the reasons which you mentioned is search for an ideal, look for social justice. It may be an illusory social justice, but that's what they are looking for. And uh, your take your takeaway, again, that you know we can't fight them so let's figure out why they're going for this and the same thread has been echoed by the other speakers uh, where smriti said that we must have cross border cooperation actively talk to each other rather than uh, fight them similarly dr tolipa also said that you know we can't really fight them independently we need to address the issues that these guys uh, that the people who take up these weapons are looking for uh, professor rohan also said the same thing that we should not fight the terrorists, we should fight the ideology that they are uh, taking up. So it's a very interesting thread. And I know we have grossly overshot our time, but we have so many questions that uh, Pallavi, with your permission, I'm going to take up one question each for each of the panelists. Uh, do I have your permission for that? Because some of the questions are really uh, interesting. And I, I feel that we would not have done justice to the discussion if we don't ask them these questions uh, we can go till about 10 minutes over that's why this so, so one we question can... thanks so one question to each panelist and i'll request you to answer in about one or two minutes uh, as concisely dr smithy uh, your the question which uh, shravan has asked you is that in your assessment what's the status of the radical groups in bangladesh under sheikh hasina um, after uh, Sheikh Hasina came to power, she has announced zero tolerance uh, towards terrorism. And after, especially after the Dhaka uh, cafe attack, uh, she has really gone behind some of the groups who have been operating, especially the branch of AQIS and ISIS, uh, which has been operating the local branch. Because, you know, the major, these are international brand, if one can say, the ISIS and AQIS, so they need not have to have the group operating, uh, you know, creating their own group. So they, in a sense, 
the local group and this international group they logged on to each other's you know the and used that network for creating uh, terrorism like for example the uh, ansarul uh, islam uh, one of the group which was also uh, operating in uh, bangladesh i think cs squarely gone against these terrorist groups almost have been successful in eliminating them but the problem is that as you know one of the speaker was speaking about this ideological affinity so unless until you deal with the ideology of radicalism which actually gives birth to terrorism i don't think uh, you know you can really uh, fight this issue of terrorism thank you dr smriti and that was very nicely and concisely answered and uh, i have one i have lots of questions for dr talipa but i think we'll be able to only take on one so i'll take something which is slightly different from what you spoke uh, so a question has been asked by ashutosh shastri he says uh, dr talipa what is your uh, perspective on the new mini quad which has been proposed of uh, us pakistan afghanistan and uzbekistan what would be their priorities of this new grouping especially against combating the taliban so if we can have your views on that okay thank you very much uh, for the question uh, first of all let me uh, uh, remind you that this uh, relatively new format uh, of uh, you know uh, grouping dealing with the afghan issue uh, was uh, i mean it appeared uh, in the context of uh, uh, uzbekistan uh, advanced uh, new idea or project of connectivity between central asia and uh, south asia as you may know recently in the middle of july in tashkent there was a very big uh, international conference uh, devoted to this very issue central asia and uh, south asia connectivity uh, regional connectivity challenges and opportunities um in uh, within uh, the framework of this conference uh, on the margins of the conference let's say uh this th there was an announcement uh, that this uh, grouping uh, was uh, set up uh, composed by Pakistan uh, Uzbekistan uh, United States and Afghanistan um yes some experts uh, also uh, raised the same question uh, here uh, in my country uh, and uh, in neighboring countries about the you know main goal of uh, this grouping uh, and uh, so far we couldn't find the clear uh, answer because uh, there were so many attempts there were, there were so many platforms diplomatic mechanisms uh, moscow process istanbul process uh, you know qatar process uh, and, and uh, different other platforms and plus this one uh, the group of four countries uh, when and uh, whether uh this uh you know platform will be efficient uh, is still an open question because the situation in Az in afghanistan is so complicated uh, in uh well uh whether these four countries uh, can join their efforts to fully uh, resolve the issue of terrorism and instability in afghanistan is an open question but uh again again just by summarizing uh i should say that this uh, platform of four countries uh, appears just in the context of this uh, you know reinforced project of connectivity between central asia and south asia uh, one of the projects uh, within this you know mega mega project uh, south asia central asia is uh, the construction of railway uh, right connecting uh, mazar e sharif kabul peshawar karachi and uh, further there will be the link to india so yeah. but uh, we know that this uh, railroad will stretch uh, through the very very unstable territory of afghanistan and pakistan so but uh, should this project be realized uh, add to this casa 1000 or tapi project and uh, some others then uh, we we have a hope or maybe illusion uh, that um, situation in afghanistan will be better off and uh, the local population in afghanistan will be engaged in uh, peaceful projects uh, they will have more jobs and so on and so on but uh, who knows uh, this is really uh, looks like an illusion but at the same time a you know explicit uh, pacifist pacifist efforts okay yeah thank you dr talipov that's uh, 
nicely answered we have a few more questions for you but i don't think we have the time you did answer some of them when you spoke about uh, uh, how the central asian republics are looking at the taliban uh, i have some more questions uh, from uh, satyam who wanted to understand a little more about the taliban ramesh who wanted to ask about the disintegration of the isis and tanish who also wanted to speak about how central asian republics intend dealing with tajikistan with the taliban but i don't think we have time for that so i'll ask one last question to professor gunaratna which uh, pallavi has put that with the crackdown of the islamist group in west papua and in papua the region already had lot of ethnic conflict so how do you see the security landscape uh, of the conflict zones in indonesia changing and that's uh, something right up your uh, alley uh, dr professor rohan western papua is a very old insurgency i have uh, traveled to western papua with the current minister of home affairs general tito karnavian general karnavian was my phd student and he was uh, before this police chief and before that counter terrorism chief so based on my visit to western papua and my own interview with opm organasi papua mardeka terrorist group i can tell you that those terrorists are operating from papua new guinea into the indonesian side so it's again a cross border issue other than that there is a very minor threat from the muslim organizations but the threat from the muslim groups is insignificant so the greatest challenge for indonesia from papua is one of separatism i believe that the world has witnessed three phases of terrorism one is the ethno nationalist uh, movements second is the left wing and right wing groups and third is the politico religious organizations so i would say that the biggest threat today for the contemporary system is from the religious threat groups but again we must not forget about ethno nationalist groups for example if you look at sri lanka the tamil tigers they they were defeated but again we are seeing that they are trying to to harness some momentum overseas but military and police and intelligence continues to maintain very tight control uh, to prevent their resurgence so i think that it is paramount for governments to keep an eye on those old conflicts but build the new capabilities both preventive operational and rehabilitative to deal with the current wave of terrorism thank you very much thank you sir and that's uh, actually that echoes what i said in the very beginning that most of the insurgencies which are now uh, moved into terrorism in, especially in the southeast asian region are very old festering since their colonial days and have now gravitated into more religious or ethnic movements and uh, Uh, i i i really feel uh, bad that i can't take on so many more questions which have come very interesting questions from people and i just like to close from my side on the question and answer session with the uh, commenting on what kal manish uh, has commented which is again echoing what i said in the beginning that one man's terrorism is another man's freedom fight and he says whose definition is to be accepted whether it's the state whether it's ideology so uh, these these questions will never go away and we do not have definitions we do not have defined uh, targets whether they are actually the terrorist whether it's their ideology whether it's their sponsors whether it's their supporters so this will continue to remain at the root of regionalization of terrorism which is what we were speaking here about we had such wonderful speakers today with us dr smriti patnaik dr talipov uh, professor rohan and we also had a surprise appearance by bruce thank you so much bruce for joining us last minute and uh, with that i would like to thank them on behalf of the audience and myself and hand over the stage back to pallavi thank you
you so much, everyone. Thank you, Tanu Pradhan, for that summarization. I think I don't have. To, I think this session was a very uh, good uh, conclusion of the entire month-long series that we've had on global terrorism. So thank you to all our speakers and our moderators for joining us and the participants. Uh, apologies again, we can't take all the questions, unfortunately, time constraint, but we definitely will keep holding these sessions. So we look forward to hosting you in the future sessions. Have a good evening, afternoon, wherever you are. So take And care. before you close the session, Pallavi, I want all of you to please uh, raise your hands and applaud Asian Pathfinders for the fantastic effort that they are doing in putting all these talks and sessions together. Pallavi and Shreyas, hats off to you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you. And, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Take care, everyone. Have a good rest of the day. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you uh, Asian Pathfinder and Midcat. Thank you. Thank you, sir.